Inspirational Creatives, episode 265. The number one biggest mistake that I, I see musicians make is they will save money over time and say, I'm going to put my record out this year, it's my year, it's my time, and they'll put together $5,000, $10,000, $50,000, whatever that number is, and they will spend all of that money, or 95% of it, to make the record. Welcome to Inspirational Creatives. I'm your host, Rob Lawrence. Join me every Friday as I chat with successful artists, producers, and creative entrepreneurs who share powerful stories and strategies. They can help you to create the life that you want. Listen each week as these inspirational creatives show you how to take your creativity to the next level. You'll learn how to create a sustainable business that inspires others and gives you the financial freedom and lifestyle that you want. Thanks for listening. Make sure you sign up at inspirationalcreatives.com to get free exclusive bonus material. And now on with the show. Rob here and welcome to another episode of Inspirational Creatives. My guest today has more than 25 years experience in the entertainment business. He is someone who is passionate about seeing musicians succeed as he is a firm believer that music has the ability to change people. Having taught workshops and spoken on panels at key music industry events, including Midem and South by Southwest, today he is someone who is avidly helping artists to create successful careers in music. By aiming to take the complexity and jargon out of the industry, he has created the Music Business Toolbox. So I'm excited to find out more and delighted to introduce to you today, Brian Calhoun. Brian, welcome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you uh, having me. So before we get stuck in, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you and who you are in the world and how you show up today. Um, who is it that you serve and, and what is it that you do, Brian? Sure. So I wear a number of different hats and I've had a varied career. I've worked in a number of different uh, roles and responsibilities and different types of companies, but everything is music related. Uh, I generally think of myself as a, uh, as a as an artist advocate and I work in the cross section of technology and music. I work with musicians. I work with a management company, which is part of Maverick, and I oversee digital strategy for a number of musicians that we work with, including Lil Wayne, Nicki Minaj, G Easy, Jill Scott, The Roots, and some others. I've worked with some other big artists in the past uh, in the same capacity, including Ti and Kanye West. I also uh, have a company that um, I recently sold to a company called Zedge, which is the world's largest phone personalization app. So I am really excited that uh, my partner and I are building a marketplace for creators to help uh, reach fans through through that platform, which is also super exciting. And I also work with, um, I've, and I have worked with a number of, uh, of, of digital streaming services and companies and in, uh, including Pandora and helping them with the artist marketing platform uh, and the tools that they help that they've created to help creators. And what I think uh, led us to this conversation today is the music business toolbox, which is a book and a set of tools that I created to help independent musicians and labels further their career. So when they decide that they want to commercially release their music and build a career in the industry, I tried to simplify it and put all the information that you need in order to be able to execute in one place. That's awesome. I'd love to ask you about the Music Business Toolbox and some of the challenges that musicians face today. But before we go into that, how did you first get into the music industry? What's the, what's the first moment you remember when you thought, this is what you want to do? Yeah, it's funny. I think it started before I knew I wanted to work in the music business when I realized what I didn't want to do. <laughs> I was in college. <laughs> I was in college at the University of Georgia. And one summer I had a had an internship at Bell South in the corporate planning department. And while I was making more than most of my friends were, I was bored out of my mind every day. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is not something I want to do for the rest of my life. And there's got to be something that I could make a living at while still enjoying myself and started working with the university's programming committee that brought concerts to school and started learning about concert promotion and production and how to produce the events. And that was super exciting. I started working with the radio station, WUOG, and uh, did, you know, had a shift on the air and started learning about radio. And I was like, wow, this is 
you know, being around music, which I'm a you know big fan, a uh, big uh, fan of music, and just really enjoyed being around it. And I was like, oh, maybe I can make a living doing this. And that was really my entree into the music industry. And when I got out of college and I was sort of faced with this decision, do I have a finance degree? Do I go and work in corporate banking or do I try to pursue a a career in the music industry? And uh, I decided to uh, do the latter and have been in it now for, yeah, as you said in the introduction, 25 years. That's amazing. I mean, many would say you took the riskier option there going into the music industry versus a a career in finance or banking or something like that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I did. I'll I'll throw one thing out there. I got one of the best pieces of advice uh, that I ever got was uh, a mentor of mine who, uh, Saul Walker, he said, uh, I was confronting him with my dilemma. And I was like, what should I do? And he said, well, he laughed and he said, you know, he goes, right now you don't have anything, so you don't have anything to lose. <laughs> that gave me, the, I think, the confidence really to, to go out and do it at that uh, crossroads in my life. That's really amazing, though. I mean, you've kind of proved those folks wrong that the music industry can be a risky one, of course, um, but which industry isn't? What do you think the secret has been to your success and how have you been able to navigate the music industry and, and, and carve out a successful career in 25 years? You know, uh, I think, it's, it's a number of things and, and everybody has a different path to success. The, and I look and I, and I'm always striving. I think that's part of it mm-hmm. is I'm always trying to, to, to do more. I like to be creative and do interesting things. I like to do stuff that other people haven't done, but it's about, I'm not necessarily the smartest guy around, but I pay attention. Mm-hmm. And I think if you pay attention and you do what you can to learn and you're and put yourself in a position where you're around other smart people and question things that you can start to determine, you know, where the industry is going and put yourself in a position where you can provide value. And uh, like they say, you don't, you skate to where the puck is going. Mm. And when I saw, you know, the industry changing and evolving rather than digging my heels in and doing more in physical retail or a and I started learning about digital and digital distribution and digital marketing and put more energy and focus in that area in the early, you know, in the late 1990s and, and early 2000s. And um, that has proved to be really beneficial because I was sort of ahead of the curve with a lot of my counterparts. Mm-hmm. And some people, many people are uh, no longer in the industry because they didn't evolve. I think that's something you also have to do is you have to evolve and one of the big advantages that people have nowadays is the access to information. There's so much stuff available now uh, just right at your fingertips online that you really don't have any excuse for not knowing a lot about how the industry is functioning. Mm. We'll come back to that because I know something that you promote through the music business toolbox is, is you cut through a lot of the jargon. So I'd love to ask you about that. Uh, before I do, what, what would you say has been the biggest change that you've seen in the music industry in, in your career? The biggest change really is it's, it's around a number of things. And, uh, there's, uh, the article that was released, I think I want to say it was October of 2004. It was, um, the long tail, which people talked hmm. about a ton years ago, but it was the change in technologies that were all happening at one time. I was doing A&R and we went from recording records on two inch tape to hard disk recording in a matter of about two, a two year period. It just changed really fast. It went from two inch tape to, uh, eight ads or, or the big tape to the eight ads to hard disk. That transition happened over a really short period of time and it became really, really inexpensive for anybody to record. And so a lot more people started recording. So that was one piece. The ability to market online to people inexpensively uh, and it's something we started working with doing email blasts in the late 1990s. And we're like, wow, this is super effective. It's crazy that people, you know, uh, you know, open rates were super high in emails back then. And uh, it was great. So and then, of course, technologies and social social media came out, websites and you could market directly to your fans. So. You didn't necessarily have to be reliant on going to uh, major media outlets like TV and radio. So that, again, opened up opportunities for people. Uh, And then uh, just distribution became 
super easy. Anybody could put their music out and have it on iTunes. And uh, now, of course, there's the other streaming services like Pandora and Spotify. And of course, there's YouTube. So those are those big barriers to entry, uh, marketing, distribution and recording. They were all very expensive and kept people out. Are, those have all gone away and has opened up uh, uh, an entirely new industry. That's absolutely fascinating. So with that in mind, tell me about the Music Business Toolbox. It sounds really exciting. And what does it do and who is it specifically designed for? Sure. And what I can do is I can tell you like how it came about because that might help and uh, give it a little bit of context. Mm. I had recognized those barriers to entry falling and thought to myself, what can I do to be a part of the new industry? So they're going, because these barriers to entry are falling, there are going to be a lot more people who are interested and have the ability to release music. So what can I do? And being a finance major and very much a numbers guy, one of the things that I was very frustrated by with working at labels was the lack of due diligence they did around finance projections and so forth. And I ultimately built some software that allowed independent labels to do detailed projections, cash flow analysis, profitability analysis, break-even analysis, and started licensing that software out to independent labels and working with them to help them through their finances. And I was working with this this one you know, relatively, well, it was really a small label and it was a guy who was pretty well off financially. He had a son who wanted to start a record label and actually spent about $750,000 to start his label and hmm. was really nowhere with it. It was kind of a mess. He hired me. I stepped in and kind of helped him get a better understanding of what needed to be done to release his music and got him on the right path. And he asked me after he got his uh, everything sort of cleaned up. He said, all right, this is great. I have a much better understanding of where we are, but now we've got a single and we're ready to start promoting it. Can you connect me with SoundScan so that they can help get my song on the radio? Hmm. And if you don't really know the, the industry, the, uh, and what the different companies do, that's a, a question that I could understand you might have. However, SoundScan has nothing to do with getting your song on the radio. SoundScan is a company that measures sales. They are the ones that do the mm -hmm. charts that say, you know, this record was number one or this record was number 10. And they have nothing to do with radio at all. So I thought, to, I had this moment where I thought to myself, you know, if this guy who has access to capital like that, he has three quarters of a million dollars willing to start a label and, you know, doesn't understand, you know, some fundamental business issues in the business like that, what chance do all these other smaller people have who don't have access to, to the capital and resources that he has? Mm -hmm. So I started to put together the Music Business Toolbox, which is an aggregation of my learnings over the years of working with all the different, working with management companies, working in distribution, working at labels, and all of the tools and information and things that I had learned and put it together to help guide this this new crop of, of DIY musicians and indie labels through the sometimes very complicated world of releasing your music. And while there's some really good resources that are, that I've read that are out there, uh, a lot of them are a little bit, uh, there, there's, there, there's too much legalese. There's too much about copyright law and, and how things came to be when most musicians really just want to know the information that they need in order to be able to get their record out and have success and market it. And so mm -hmm. I stripped out all that stuff and just said, here's what you need to know. Here's how it's done. And I put together a set of tools that go along with it. So it's things like templates for marketing plans and business plans and one sheets and release schedules and forms that you'll need for registering with the performing rights organizations and making sure that you keep track of your metadata and metadata is a, a, a subject we can go into detail about if you want, but it's sometimes something that 
people's eyes gloss over, but is super important. You know, what are your ISRC codes and your UPC codes and ISWCs and how do you get them and how do you keep track of them? Um, but it's, it's all of these, these kinds of things and, and along with tools for budgeting and creating your, uh, your rider for uh, hospitality and, uh, technical riders for touring, creating a budget for touring, creating a budget for marketing and production recording. Um, so it's as much as I could put into, uh, into it, uh, in order to be able to help that crop of, uh, new musicians trying to put their recordings out in this uh, in this new economy. That's amazing. So, is it specifically for musicians, or is it for others too? It's uh, yeah, it's really for musicians. Anyone who's going to be releasing sound recordings. Um, so, I guess it could work for a spoken word artist as well. But it's really for it's really for musicians. So, why do you believe musicians get so stuck when they're trying to attempt to carve a career in the music industry today? There's a few problems. There's there's misconceptions out there about sometimes how hard it is or sometimes how easy it is. There are people who will say, "You don't need a label, just put your record out and you can have you can be successful." But that's not really true. There are, you know, tens of millions of recordings that are out there and released and between Spotify and Apple and Pandora and YouTube and Google and Amazon, all these services have t- literally tens of millions of songs on their services. But how do you get to the right one? So just saying, oh, we, you can put your record out and be successful. It's not that easy. Mm-hmm. But it's also not as hard as some people say where it's impossible. So while, yes, there are you know, 20, 30, 40 million tracks out there, you can have success if you work and find uh, your niche and you know what you're doing. I think the other thing that has been a challenge is the information that I've put together in the music business toolbox hasn't really been in one place Mm. that is actionable. Mm -hmm. And that was a really important thing as I was putting it together is make sure everything is actionable. It just hasn't been in one place. So even people who are going to music business conferences and you know, trying to learn, there's so much information that you can get that it can be really hard to sift through all of it to be able to create an action plan. Mm. And that's why I put those things together. And then I have to say that probably the, the number one biggest mistake mm. that I've see, I see musicians make is they will save money over time and say, I'm going to put my record out this year, it's my year, it's my time, and they'll put together... Five thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand dollars, whatever that number is, and they will spend all of that money or ninety-five percent of it to make the record, and they'll leave nothing for everything else. Hmm. They'll get the best engineer that they can get. They'll record in the best studio that they can get. They'll have the best studio musicians, and the record will sound great. And then they'll just put it out with nothing, with nothing hmm. to support. And when I pose this to musicians, I, you know, I ask them to think about other industries. It's like, what other industry spends all of its money in research and development and nothing in marketing? Nobody does that. Hmm. When Pfizer creates a new drug, they, whatever, they spend a billion dollars in research and development, and then they spend a fortune on commercials because we all see them all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, when GM or Ford or anybody makes a new car, they spend a lot of money to create that car, but then they spend a ton of money to, to, to market it as well. Any consumer product, business products, B2B products also require marketing. You can't spend all of your money to create something and leave nothing to, to let people know that it's available. Wow. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's really insightful. So what do you feel musicians could be doing differently then? Uh, so a big part of it is planning, uh, making sure that you are developing a realistic plan and then following it, and also managing expectations. It's not realistic for uh, a DIY artist with a total budget of ten thousand dollars to think that they're gonna they're gonna have the same opportunities for success with their release as some giant major label artist. You know, you're, you're not going to have the same opportunities with a new release as Justin Bieber or even not even Justin Bieber. It doesn't have to be someone that big, but someone large with a 
big support uh, uh, team and label behind them, with also with deep pockets. So manage your expectations, but create a plan that is well informed. Hmm. I like that. Yeah. So it's it's more of a mindset and a strategic type approach in that sense. That's it exactly. That's it exactly. And and I try really hard to to make sure that that comes through in the uh, the music business toolbox to help people manage expectations, but also create an actual plan that will give them the ability to have success. Yeah, I like that. And I like what you're saying there about expectations too. So with that in mind, you know, how possible is it to make a living or to make money in music today? It is possible. I see more and more people doing it all of the time. But it's also about defining what success means to you as an individual. Mm. For some people, success is I can quit tending bar and make enough money from my music that I can support myself. For some people, it's I just want to be able to pay for myself to go back in the studio and make records again. Some people, success is I want to headline a stadium tour. Not that many people make it to that level, Mm -hmm. but it really starts with defining success for, for you. Uh, and, and then managing expectations and building a plan around it. Yeah. So it's about having some clear goals in mind and then actually creating yes. some kind of strategic plan to how you're meaningfully going to achieve that and, and also measure that, I'm hearing. That's right. Yes, absolutely. And there's lots of measurement tools too now. But again, it's defining what, what does success mean for you and, you know, take baby steps. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't have to start out with a, a, a headlining tour, but uh, hopefully you can, you can get there. Yeah, that's fantastic. Coming back to this point that you were positioning about marketing, which is fascinating to me. And yeah, I've seen that that, that example that you described so many times over. When it comes to actual marketing, what do you feel are some of the keys to success when it comes to trying to get noticed as a musician? Surely it's not just having a big budget. No, it's not. It's certainly about being creative. Look, it all starts with with the music, though. Mm. It definitely starts with music. (laughs) You've got to have great music to, to start with. But once you do have that, building your image and leveraging the outlets that are available to you, being consistent is also really, really important in this day and age. Mm. So putting something out, putting out music on a regular basis so that you, your, your fans don't forget you and you can, can build your fans and build and connect with people is really important. You want to be able to connect with people time and time again and continue to to grow your fan base. One of the big opportunities that you have now is to work with the the DSPs, the digital service providers. So what's fortunate is that companies like YouTube and Pandora and Spotify and SoundCloud, those companies especially, give you tools that allow you to market to your fans because increasingly fans are reaching out to the artists or connecting with the artists through the DSPs. So doing things where you can leverage those platforms to reach the fans is great. But also leveraging other technologies, certainly social media, the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the Twitters and the Snapchats of the world. And I also put YouTube in there because it's also got social networking components. But using those tools to have a connection with your fan, but then pulling them in so that you can get their email address and phone numbers and you that way own the relationship between yourself as an artist and your fan and you don't have someone in the middle. And the example that I use and uh, many others have used is if you had built your entire fan relationship through MySpace, when MySpace went down, you had no way to reach your fans again. Hmm. So if you have their email address and or cell phone number, you always have a way to be, that you can reach out to them. So getting people to subscribe to your YouTube channel is great. Getting them to follow you on Twitter and Instagram and like your Facebook page are, are great and to follow you on Spotify. But getting these other direct connections with them is 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 also really really key especially for developing artists yeah that's fascinating yeah and it's it sounds like so many other industries and how they're operating these days and yes. yeah it's really interesting to hear because the music industry in some respects from where i've seen it, it's always done things its own way and has always been out there on its own but it's very much aligning in, in, in this day and age of uh, social media and technology 
You mentioned metadata as we're on the topic of technology and the recent evolution of music industry. You mentioned metadata earlier. Why is that such an important subject right now for musicians? Because <laughs> if you want to get paid and be able to accurately track your music, you need to make sure that you have good, clean metadata and that it gets absorbed into all of the systems. So if you are, you don't want to get confused with another artist, you don't want your music to be uh, miscategorized or in wrong genres uh, on the streaming services because you didn't label it properly, you you will get paid based on the numbers that you have. So your ISRC code is super important to make sure that you have uh, ISRCs, your international standard recording code. You want to make sure that that's accurate when you are submitting your music to the streaming services. Uh, and download services. The way that these services are making their payments and categorizing the music all has a lot to do with the metadata associated with it. So making sure that your metadata is clean and accurate and submitted properly is vital. Mm. It could sound complex. Is it complex to do that? No, it's actually not that complicated. You just have to be diligent about doing mm. it. Uh, again, as I can see, one of the things, a lot of the tools that are in the toolbox are things that I built out of, I just needed them. One of them was a workbook so that I could keep track of the ISRC codes and UPC codes and the other information about when we recorded and where we recorded, release dates, song titles, song length, all of those other pieces of information, who the side artists are, the publishers, all that information, I just needed a place to put it. And be able to keep it, keep track of it and keep it accurate and updated so that if I needed it for something, I was able to quickly and easily access it and give it to who needed it. And I put together that workbook. So the workbook is part of the music business toolbox so you can keep track of it easy. But getting those numbers uh, are generally really easy as well. You can register online. So sometimes your your distributor will can get them for you. Your aggregator, so a company like a like a CD Baby or a TuneCore, Orchard or DistroKid, there's a number of them. They can help get them for you, but you still need to keep track of it. Or you can go get them on your own uh, directly, but it's really not that difficult. Yeah. So, uh, and I love, by the way, the way you're actually uh, you're, you're keeping to your word and you're you're breaking up the jargon as we go along here, which is uh, which is fantastic. So, uh, <laughs> right. I really appreciate that. So, this is all really really exciting, and I think we've got a really good feel for what the music business toolbox can do and 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 how it's going to help people, particularly musicians. In your view, I feel we live in really exciting times right now. But from your view, what is there? Do you believe to look forward to in the music industry right now? Oh, I am incredibly excited about the music industry. I am uh, ecstatic about it. I remember, I remember being at the Future of Music Coalition's conference years ago, and for the first time hearing about what they, at the time they called the Celestial Jukebox. I was like, <laughs> what is that? It's like, like, imagine being able to be on your phone and listen to any song at any time, no matter. I was like, wow, that's a crazy concept. That's awesome. <laughs> But like we're living that out now. Hmm. And with all of the barriers to entry that have fallen and are continuing to fall, it's becoming easier to connect with fans, that there's more and more great music that is going to be made and more and more people who may not have otherwise been able to succeed as a musician, now they have the chance to do so. Hmm. And... I, I'm just incredibly excited about doing my part to facilitate that and be able to give more people the opportunity to create their art and share it with the world rather than working at a gas station because they couldn't get signed by a major label. Mm. That's not the world we live in. That's not what it is. And this is just an incredibly exciting time for my friends who are independent musicians. Mm. I'm excited for them for their ability to make a living. And I'm excited for the fans. I'm excited for the fans to be able to hear music that you really want. When I grew up, I, you know, it was, you know, you listen to the radio and what the radio played is what you knew. But my world is, is your world is so big now. It's, you have at, at, at your fingertips, you have access to 30 million songs through those streaming services. That is an incredible opportunity. It's amazing for music fans. And it's just going to get better. Yeah. And I guess with all these new technologies like, you know, virtual reality and, of course, gaming platforms and that, you know, accelerating, getting bigger and getting even 
greater audiences. I, I guess this is all coming into into the mix as well. Oh yeah, it's 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 really exciting seeing some of the things that uh, I think are also on the horizon with virtual reality and augmented reality and how those things mix with music because people have uh, a great opportunity to express their art and combine it with other types of media to create who knows what. I'm super excited to see what people are going to make. Seeing some of like these 360 videos mm. is is crazy. It's incredible. And 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 VR videos. I can't wait to see what comes next. Yeah, exciting times indeed, absolutely. Um I share your passion there by the way. I I feel we do live in incredibly exciting times and uh, I can't wait to see what happens next. Quite right. literally, yes. Exactly. I love the um, the quote that you mentioned that I've read in, in more than one place, actually. Why do you believe music has the ability to change people? Uh, it changed me. Hmm. <laughs> I, I, it has the ability to change the, the fan, the listener, but it also has the ability to change the, the creator. It's exciting that people who have this creativity within them, for them to have this art form to express themselves and get it out. And for those people to do more and more is, is great, but it changed, it changed me. Uh, I grew up on public enemy and public enemy. I say this to this day, public enemy changed my life. And I had <laughs> a bit of a side note with that. I, I still say like the, the coolest thing about being in the music business. And I've had great opportunity to work with lots of like super big artists whose music I love, but I think the coolest thing is that uh, that not only do I know Chuck D, but Chuck D knows me. So that's <laughs> that's super cool. But uh, yeah, it, it's it changed me. Like music changes me. It changes what music makes me feel and what makes what it makes people feel. It's I just I want to do my part, my my little small part in the world to facilitate that. What music has done and meant to me in my life, I, it, I, if I can help give back, I'm excited to be able to do so. Brian, I really appreciate your time today and chatting to you about all of this stuff. What's the top tip or one piece of advice you'd love to give to every modern musician today? Uh, I, I say that the number one thing is, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, the number one thing is don't spend all of your money in one place. Don't spend it all to record your record. Make sure that you save money to to do all of the other things associated with with your release. That's, I would say, number one. And in fact, I would say if you only have, if you have, let's say, $10,000, try to get your record recorded for twenty five dollars to $3,500 and save the rest for everything yeah. else. So that you have the opportunity uh, to do uh, to, to to spread the word on it. Unless you only want your friends and family to hear it, you need to save some money to be able to allow other people promote it, market it, and share it with the world. The other tip I would say, I know you asked for one, but I'll give you another one: is is build the right team around you. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? When you look at sort of like the key team members that you have, it's it's your your lawyer and your manager and your agent, someone to help you with your digital strategy and marketing, your publicist. Those are the people who are going to be key to you. And it's not realistic for the independent DIY artist to go and hire high end people on that from the very beginning, but. Even if you're working with a friend of yours, make sure that they're doing their part to contribute. So a lot of bands will have one person in there who is sort of in charge of their social media and their digital marketing, which is great, but make sure that that person is as knowledgeable as you can afford at the time in order to be able to help you fully take advantage of that particular stream. When you get a lawyer, you're not going to be able to negotiate every single thing that you sign. And I think that's also a bit of a, a misconception out there that is like, you know, have a lawyer look at everything you sign. That's not realistic. It's not realistic to think that as a DIY artist, CD Baby is going to negotiate specific terms for you to distribute your music. They distribute music for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of musicians. Mm -hmm. It's not realistic the terms of use that they have on their site or what you're going to have to agree to, but they're fair, they're reasonable. And if those particular 
terms don't work for you, there, there are other options that you should consider. ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, Sound Exchange, these performing rights organizations, you can't negotiate with them independently. Mm-hmm. So you're going to have to agree to those terms of use in the beginning. But when you do have to start, uh, when you do start having individual agreements that are presented to you for, I don't know, maybe you, or, or with a record label or a licensing deal to use a song that you created on a commercial or something, then you're going to want to have an attorney uh, on board ready to, to, to work with you to help, help you negotiate that and help guide you through that. Your manager is a very key person uh, or team, but it's not... You know, it may not be realistic that you're going to have a, a super big time manager to represent you in the beginning because uh, people need to, uh, you know, understand that a manager makes money when the artist makes money. And if a big time manager whose client makes $10 million a year, uh, if they're not focusing on that client and they focus on you, they're losing out on whatever additional money they could potentially be making for that for that big client. So. You may need to work with a friend who is interested in management or be self-managed in the beginning. And that, that, that can be a, a lot of work, but the, someone who represents your interests at all times is also really important to make sure that you're taking advantage of the opportunities that are before you. Publicist, it's great to have a publicist, but it's not realistic to spend $7,500 a month or $10,000 on a, a month on a big name publicist. You may need to, you know, talk to friends and artists who are at your level or maybe a little above your level, but also in the genre that you're working in and ask around who's been successful. Ask your friends who are those musicians about who they've worked with. Find uh, other people who that you, you've seen getting good coverage in some of maybe especially like some of the smaller blogs and magazines and stuff like that. Like where how are they getting how are they getting out there? Those are some of your key team members and getting them in place and making sure you hold them accountable and uh, you know manage your expectations. Once you hire a publicist, you're not going to be on the cover of Rolling Stone next month. So you know, be realistic with what your expectations are. That's great. I'm really glad I asked the question. That's really, really insightful there. Um, on that tip about hiring a manager, I thought that was fascinating, actually, what you were saying there. Um, from a musician's point of view, it, how important is it for a musician to manage themselves in the first instance towards attracting a good manager? I, I think it's hugely important, and you're you're absolutely going to be your own manager in the very, very beginning. But I also think it's a good learning experience for artists to do that because you then have a better perspective when you do have a manager, mm. when you do are able to, you know, sort of move to the next level and have someone who represents you. But, you know, again, part of why I put together the music business toolbox is to be able to put all the information and things together in one place so that you can do it on your own. That's fantastic. Super. So I just got a spinny wheel there on my uh, my machine. I just it's like uh, uh, no, 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 we're all good. We're still recording. And that's all I care about. <laughs> that's all, okay. we're all good. So uh, thank you for that. Great. So just a couple of very quick questions then. So who or what has inspired you most recently? Mm. You know, I have to say the things that I've been very excited about is seeing the new tools that the DSPs are giving to creators. Mm. So Pandora has this product called AMP, the artist marketing platforms that allows musicians at every level on the platform to speak to their fans and say, and do what they call artist audio message where you can say, hey, this is artist X and thank you for listening to me and tap the link on your screen to buy my concert tickets because I'm coming to your city, doing that, that kind of thing and promoting your music there. Uh, on Spotify, you have great opportunities to get followers and reach your, uh, reach your fans through that. With YouTube being able to push to merch or concert tickets from your music videos and build up your subscriber base. So watching these companies build the tools that give you the ability to connect with your fans, that has been really inspiring. I've, I'm, I'm super happy. It's something I've been wanting them to do for a long time and watching over the past few years, watching them build these tools uh, and release them to the public has really been exciting. 
That's fascinating. Um, you sound like you're really grateful for the career that you've had so far in the music industry. What are you grateful for today, Brian? I am. Well, personally, I'm grateful for my friends and family and my my beautiful wife and my son and uh, just all the great friends that I have. Uh, and professionally, I am very grateful for the ability to work with so many really smart, interesting, creative, inspiring, motivating people. Just uh, I, I, I'm very, very blessed and fortunate to be around lots of really great, smart people uh, all the time who always inspire me to do more. That's awesome. So where can folks find out more about you, Brian? And of course, the Music Business Toolbox. Yeah, sure. It's musicbusinesstoolbox.com. And I am on all socials at Brian Calhoun, which is B-R-Y-A-N-C-A-L-H-O-U-N. And that's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, everything. That's awesome. So that's musicbusinesstoolbox.com. And that's Brian Calhoun at B-R-Y-A-N-C-A-L-H-O-U-N on social media. That's right. Brian, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for listening. Nothing beats the stories and advice of an expert to help you raise your creative game. I would love to know what you thought about today's episode, so don't forget to subscribe in iTunes where you can rate and review the show. If you like this episode, I invite you to share it on Facebook or Twitter with the one person you know who will benefit from the wisdom shared here today. You can find the show notes on inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash podcast. If you have a burning question or a great idea for a guest, head on over to inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash contact where you can connect with me there. This episode of Inspirational Creatives is hosted on the podcast platform Libsyn. If you're thinking of starting your own podcast and if you're looking for a podcast host, Libsyn is the podcast hosting platform that the Inspirational Creatives podcast has been reliably hosted on since launching in November 2014. If you'd like to give it a try, I'm pleased to share with you the promo code CREATIVE, which you can use on Libsyn.com. That promo code is good for up to two months free trial. If you use the code at the beginning of a month, then you'll receive all of that month and the next month free. However, if you use the promo code later in the month, you'll get the remainder of that month free and the following month free too. That promo code is CREATIVE, which you can use on Libsyn.com.